Hi, my name is Debbie Levine. I'm from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and Harvard Medical School, and today I'll be speaking about the postmenopausal pelvis. So, the postmenopausal pelvis. On this talk, what I'd like to talk about is what's important to know about the postmenopausal uterus and ovary. We'll be talking a little bit about how hormones affect the appearance of the uterus and ovaries. We'll talk about how we distinguish between benign and malignant disease, and then discuss Doppler and how helpful is it in distinguishing between benign and malignant disease. Now, menopause, at least in the United States, is very, very common. We have about 280 million people, and over a quarter of American women are postmenopausal, with 35 million being greater than 50 years of age. The life expectancy for a girl born today is about 80 years. So we have a large number of people who are living in the time of menopause. We need to know about the appearance of the postmenopausal ovaries because it can sometimes be difficult to visualize them. It's not as easy when women are younger and they have nice, large-looking ovaries with lots of follicles and cysts that let us see them. So sonography of the postmenopausal ovaries are important because sometimes there'll be a palpable mass on physical exam, and we're trying to figure out if that's an excellent etiology. Some women will be at high risk for ovarian cancer and desire screening. Um, and then if a patient has a known mass, uh, we need to know how to think about it. If it's completely cystic, then walled anechoic, it's likely benign. No surgery is probably needed. If it's complex or solid, there are other things that we need to think about. Now, if you ever see a cyst like this, filled with echoes, in a younger woman, you'd say it's a hemorrhagic cyst. In a woman who's truly postmenopausal, it's an abnormal finding. Now, many women who are postmenopausal, for example, 50, 51, 52, still have spontaneous cycles. And even after menopause, years after menopause, a spontaneous cycle can occur. So if something has a high likelihood of being a hemorrhagic cyst by its appearance, you might want to give one short interval follow-up in a postmenopausal woman. But just realize if you see something that looks like a hemorrhagic cyst, you need to think twice. If the woman gives a history of being postmenopausal, this is not a normal finding in a postmenopausal woman. If she's 40, you're going to think about it differently than if she's 70. Why are postmenopausal women different, difficult to scan? Well, one is they tend to have a little bit more, they, I should say we, uh, tend to have a little bit more abdominal fat. Um, there can be atrophic vaginitis, which might make either the technologist uncomfortable putting in the probe or even the patient uncomfortable putting in the transvaginal probe. And as I mentioned earlier, the ovaries can be small and lack follicles and be difficult to see. Here we've got a nice, normal-appearing postmenopausal ovary, uh, very almond-shaped in its appearance and hypoechoic. It turns out that ovarian visualization gets more difficult the longer you go after menopause, and it makes sense because the ovaries get smaller and smaller. So if you uh, believe the studies that you read, it would be about 80%, less than five years after menopause, going down to maybe 75%, five to 10 years, and down to 60% at greater than 10 years. Um, Transabdominal and transvaginal visualization of the ovaries can also be affected by if the patient's had a hysterectomy. Um, think about it. If the uterus is in place, you have your landmarks for knowing where the ovaries are and the ligaments help hold the ovaries in place. But once the uterus is gone, uh, the ovaries can move elsewhere and can be more difficult to visualize. So if a woman has not had a hysterectomy, about 76% of the time we can see the ovaries. And if she's had a hysterectomy, that can go down to about 30, 43%. Now, there was a paper published quite a while ago at this point, ovarian volumes measured by ultrasound, uh, bigger than we think, uh, looking at older women. These were all uh, supposed to be uh, postmenopausal, but you can see the age range is different. Uh, transabdominal and transvaginal. And the percent of ovaries visualized going from 20% uh, to 99%. And for postmenopausal ovaries, I have a hard time believing um, that 99% of the time uh, they were seen. And I think a lot of times when ovaries, so-called ovaries are measured, it's actually going to be loops of bowels. So you want to be very careful uh, that you're actually looking at an ovary. And then when you look at these volumes that are recorded as normal, uh, they have a wide range uh, going from 0.2 um, all the way up to 
uh, centimeters cubed. So how in the world with this wide range of normal are we to think about a postmenopausal ovary? Well, basically, you want to compare the two sides. Now, some people say, well, you can look for peristalsis to see if it's bowel or not. But if you think about your own colon, it doesn't peristalse that often. So if you're looking at a loop of small bowel, yes, it might peristalse. But if you're looking at a loop of colon, sigmoid, it might not. Um, you also want to look and see if it trails off if you have margins. You also want to see if you can see mucosa um, and if it really looks that, like that nice almond-shaped ovary that I showed you before. The next topic in postmenopausal ovaries are the cysts. How in the world should we think about postmenopausal adnexal cysts? Why do we care? Well, we care because greater than 85% of ovarian cancers are cystic, and we want to make sure that we're not missing a lesion. So what do we need to think about when we see a cyst on a pelvic ultrasound in a postmenopausal woman? Well, first, you want to make sure you're not looking at the cervix. Nebothian cysts are very, very common. They can be anechoic. They can have debris. Um, but they're all going to be located in the cervix. So that is very, very clear. So make sure you're not being faked out. Sometimes you'll see a mass that looks like this out in the adnexa. That would look very, very scary if it was indeed arising from the ovary. But you turn on color, and this is all vasculature, pelvic varices. Sometimes you'll see a cyst right next to an ovary, para-ovarian cyst, and para-ovarian cysts are almost always benign, very, 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 very rare uh, for a tumor, let alone a cancer, to arise in a para-ovarian cyst. But we want to treat them like any other adnexal cyst and look at them very, very carefully, look at the wall, look for any internal echoes. Sometimes you'll see what's clearly a hydrosalpinx. You'll be able to say it's a hydrosalpinx that does not need follow-up based on the ultrasound appearance. But sometimes, if you don't look at the hydrosalpinx lined out like that, it will look like this. This is the same patient. So if you ever see what looks like a multi-septated ovarian cyst and you're worried about cancer, make sure that it's not actually a hydrosalpinx that you're just cutting slightly differently and looking like a complex ovarian cyst. This is basically a benign finding. Very, very infrequently, you'll have a bladder diverticulum uh, that masquerades as an adnexal cyst. Uh, this is a very old case. You can tell by all the scratches on the images, but this is the bladder, and this is the adnexal cyst. And the way you can tell is you have the patient empty the bladder, and the diverticulum will look different, or sometimes you'll actually see the communication with the diverticulum. Now, I've just been talking about looking at these adnexal cysts, and I've been assuming uh, that you're doing both transabdominal and transvaginal scanning. Transabdominal scanning is important in order to look outside of the range of the vaginal probe, but transvaginal scanning is important for the best characterization of adnexal masses. So if you look at this particular mass here, here's the bladder, here's this mass. You might think it's a cyst, it's very hypoechoic, but you do transvag and you can actually see that there are echoes within this fibroma. If you look at published literature on simple cysts, you can see why ultrasound characterization is problematic. I point out to this paper because they looked at a large number of postmenopausal women, over 3,000. They found simple cysts in 6.6%, and they operated on 18 of them. So they only operated on the minority. And what they found were serous adenomas. Well, that makes sense for a simple cyst, but the other lesions don't make sense for a simple cyst. Cystadenofibroma, you'd expect a solid fibrous component. Dermoid, very rare for those to be simple cysts. Normal ovaries, um, maybe it was a paraovarian cyst, maybe it was a tube, maybe they were looking at a loop of bowel. But the fibrothecoma and adenofibroma, those are solid lesions, and probably they were solid lesions that looked like simple cysts, but they didn't have their gain set appropriately, or they didn't look with a vaginal probe, or maybe they didn't turn on color to see internal vascularity. All very, very important things to look at before you disregard a simple cyst in a postmenopausal woman. This is a study um, that we did a long time ago, 1992, looking at asymptomatic postmenopausal women. And we did transabdominal and transvaginal scans th every three months for a year and then every six months in the second year. And we found lots of adnexal cysts. Now, most of these cysts were very, very small, less than a centimeter. 17% of the women had cysts on their first screen, 24% had them at some point in time during the two-year-old follow-up, and 97% were less than or equal to three centimeters.
Then looking at over time what happened with these postmenopausal cysts, you might think, well, if it's a para-ovarian cyst, it won't change. That's this 28% didn't change, but a large number actually disappeared. Now, cysts can disappear because you don't see them or because they actually resolve, so you want to make sure that you're doing good quality follow-up studies. Uh, but the postmenopausal ovary can actually, like I said before, have a spontaneous cycle, especially if you're in your first five years after menopause, the early postmenopausal period. Some of these cysts enlarged during the follow-up period. Some got bigger and then smaller, and some got smaller but didn't completely disappear. Here's another study uh, reported in 2002 by Valentin. They had 134 postmenopausal women with 160 cysts. They said 25% were complex but benign appearing, and they followed up them up for eight years. 9% of the cysts ended up being removed, 29% of them disappeared, 13% of the women got new cysts over time, and 49% increased or decreased in size or stayed the same. So again, they're finding similar size, uh, similar appearances of cysts. Some go, some occur, um, some increase and decrease in size. Very important to realize this. And I think the other issue are these complex cysts. You might see a little bit of debris within them, uh, but overall they look benign. These are very scary and we tend to follow them up very closely. This is the uh, example of a cyst that's disappearing. On the first screen, it's three centimeters. On a follow-up six months later, three millimeters. What if it's not a simple cyst? You can see from this image, last menstrual period 15 years ago, this really looks like a dermoid. It's got all these bright echoes. It's got some linear bright echoes within it. Well, if it looks like a dermoid, it probably is a dermoid. We think about dermoids as being tumors of younger women, but if this patient had a dermoid her whole life. It was never removed. It's still there. It's not going to go away on its own. So if it looks like a dermoid, it's a dermoid. The problem with postmenopausal women is that the incidence of dermoids transforming into squamous cell carcinoma, that risk increases with patient age. So frequently, if you see a dermoid of this size in a patient of this age, it will end up being removed, even though it's most likely a benign finding. Here's another postmenopausal woman with a lesion that looks like a dermoid. It's a dermoid. This, though, doesn't really look like a dermoid. It's a 28 centimeter cyst. It's got a few septations. Most likely, it's going to be a serous cystadenoma. Even though the patient's postmenopausal, this has, even though this is big, it still has very benign characteristics. But when these lesions get to be this size, they tend to be removed. One of the concerns is that you might not be seeing the entire wall of the cyst. If a patient really doesn't want to have surgery, if a lesion is more than seven centimeters in size, we're currently recommending an MR to ensure uh, that the entire cyst is being well characterized. Once you see solid elements, that's when you're going to worry about malignancy. So a cyst with solid elements, you're going to look for blood flow. Look for blood flow in that solid element and see if there's any blood flow. If that's a real finding, you're going to worry about a malignancy. One single thin septation isn't bad. One tiny nodule without flow is not necessarily bad. But once you get to the thick irregular septations, the nodules, the nodules with flow, that's when you're going to think about cancer. So here we've got somebody, her, her last menstrual period was 45 years ago. She was like 90 years old. This is her bladder. This is a transvaginal scan. She couldn't empty her bladder real well. You're seeing this cyst. This is a thin septation here, but this is a more solid appearing nodule. You're going to think about a malignancy in her. And this is a more florid appearing malignancy with large uh, solid area. And here's a different patient with a very complex cyst, cystic and solid areas. And blood flow. Blood flow is so incredibly helpful, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. Here's a solid lesion with flow. I know it's a solid lesion. It doesn't look like a fibroma, fibrothecoma. If it's bilateral, we're going to think about metastatic disease. Here we've got bilateral enlarged ovaries and ascites. You're going to think about metastatic disease. Here we've got some omental cake. Uh, definitely metastatic disease. Well, let's now turn to Doppler. Is Doppler helpful in helping us determine when we see one of these lesions if it's benign or malignant? When Doppler first came out, low malignance, uh, low resistive index, and I'm showing you the resistive index here, you take systole minus diastole divided by systole, that's going to give you the resistive index, 
Low resistive index, less than four, was associated with malignancy. But there were a lot of problems with this because the corpus luteum has a lot of blood flow and has a low resistive index, and so do inflammatory and metabolically active masses. A high resistive index is associated with a non-functioning ovary and with benign masses, uh, but you can also see areas of high resistance within tumors. A lot of papers have come out on uh, re use of Doppler in adnexal masses, and the very high sensitivity and specificity that was originally reported has definitely uh, fallen out of favor. This exam uh, paper from Bromley in 1994 had 8% sensitivity and 82% specificity uh, for looking at malignant masses. Here I'm looking at a solid element in what looks like a tumor. Um, and in one area I get an RI of 33% and in another area an RI of 77, I'm sorry, 66%. So again, you need to look around in the solid area uh, for the most abnormal appearing area of resistance. And here we've got a tumor uh, with blood flow in the solid element. And of course you're going to think about a cancer in this case or in this case. And it really doesn't matter what size this lesion is. This is a 2.2 centimeter nodule with a tiny little solid element within it. But that tiny solid element has blood flow. And so it doesn't matter what this patient's age is. It doesn't matter that this cyst size is in the physiologic range. Once you have a solid nodule with blood flow, the likelihood is that it's malignant. And this was a very early stage cancer. This is what we need to look for if we want to find early cancers. Here's one of the lesions I showed you before with this large kind of frond-like solid area, lots of blood flow. Look at this resistive index. This is a beautiful resistive index for a benign lesion, but none of us would call this a benign lesion. There's a large solid area with blood flow. This is malignant. Ignore the resistive index. So let's kind of put all of this information together in how we should think about postmenopausal solid and nexal masses. Anechoic cysts very, very, very common. Thin-walled, anechoic, through transmission, they're benign. If they're large, they might be neoplastic, like a serous cystadenoma, but it will still be a benign lesion. Complex cyst. Well, you can have a hemorrhagic cyst if a woman spontaneously ovulated, so you want to check for that. But if it's persistent, if there's nodularity and septations, that's going to increase the likelihood of malignancy. If it's a solid mass, it turns out that fibroma and thecomas are going to be the most common solid mass, but you don't want to forget about metastatic disease and undifferentiated carcinoma. Here's a very interesting autopsy study done by Valentin in 2003. They took 52 women who were having an autopsy without a history of gynecologic malignancy, and they scanned the ovaries that were removed at autopsy. So these are the ovaries that are actually out of the body, and they found 54% of them had cysts, ranging in size from 2 millimeters to 6 centimeters. Half of the women had cysts. Interestingly, 12% had solid lesions, including fibromas, cystadenofibroma, Brenner tumor, and a chunk of calcification, what they called a dystrophic calcification. Now the pathologist then sliced and diced the ovaries and found an additional solid lesion and an additional 85 cysts. So what's the take home message from here? Cysts are incredibly common. So are fibromas. Now I think when the ovaries are out and you're seeing one of these small solid lesions, that's different when the ovaries are in the body and you're seeing small solid lesions. Probably the lesions that we're seeing are larger than the lesions that, that were seen on this autopsy study. But nonetheless, realize that these are incredibly common, usually benign findings. In fact, from this study, um, their conclusion was that small benign adnexal cysts and small benign solid tumors are so common in postmenopausal women that their presence may be regarded as normal. Well, I don't have a problem ignoring the small benign appearing adnexal cysts. I tend to follow up the hemorrhagic cysts that otherwise look benign to reassure everyone. The solid tumors still tend to be operated on, although if women are not a good operative risk, you might want to look up this paper and use this as a reason uh, to follow these patients very carefully. So again, management, 
of postmenopausal adnexal cysts. If they're benign, appearing anechoic thin wall through transmission, less than a centimeter, they can be safely ignored. One to seven centimeters, we tend to get a yearly follow-up ultrasound. Greater than seven centimeters, they're likely neoplastic, but likely benign, cystadenoma. You might want to do an MR to make sure you're not missing anything. You might want to do surgery, but if the patient's not an operative candidate, you can safely follow these. Anything atypical, solid elements, septations, think about having surgery. This is the only example I have of a totally benign appearing adnexal cyst coming back and having a solid element. We know it has to happen at some point in time that cystadenomas, cystadenofibromas, did I miss a tiny nodule back here? Who knows, but she was three years postmenopause, 12 millimeter anechoic cyst came back with this tiny nodule. There was no blood flow in the nodule. Um, three years later, um, you see that. She ended up not having surgery and continuing to be followed and did fine. Well, we're done with the ovary. We're now ready to move to the uterus. After menopause, the body of the uterus gets smaller and smaller, and many, many years after menopause, the uterus will attain kind of an infantile configuration with the body of the uterus being smaller than the cervix. Sometimes, especially if the patient has hypertension, renal failure, diabetes, you'll see arcuate artery calcifications. And the reason that I mention these, they're in the outer third of the myometrium, is that frequently people don't realize that outside of the arcuate arteries is where you're going to measure the uterus. And these can also make it difficult to see the endometrium because of shadowing. So here's a patient with arcuate artery calcifications, transabdominal scan. In each of these patients here, we're looking at the transvaginal scan, a little bit of fluid that you couldn't see here, transvaginal scan for a better look at the endometrium. So the postmenopausal uterus is generally smaller than premenopausal. What should we do if it's big? Well, you can imagine if a woman had a, a huge number of fibroids premenopausal, perimenopausal, they can go wild and grow. Postmenopausal, it's going to take a long time for the uterus to get back down to size. So what do we do when there's postmenopausal uterine enlargement? Well, the first thing is to look at old studies. Were there fibroids before? Was there adenomyosis before? How has it changed in size? If a woman has a growing uterus after menopause, you need to worry about sarcoma. These can appear similar to fibroids, but will tend to have rapid growth. Adenomyosis has a very classic appearance with these alternating bands of shadowing and through transmission. You can have heterogeneous, diffuse, asymmetric enlargement of the uterus without a focal mass. You may or may not see small myometrial cysts. Now, adenomyosis we typically think of involving women ages 40 to 60. So you can imagine in that early postmenopausal period, you're going to frequently see adenomyosis as you're scanning patients with enlarged uteri. Another cause of postmenopausal uterine enlargement that should be very obvious is fluid. Now, fluid can occur in an obstructed uterus, and we always worry about that obstruction being due to cancer. Here we can see a tumor. Uh, hard to know if this is coming out of the cervix or the lower endometrium, but it's definitely causing obstruction. So the obstruction can lead to a fluid-filled uterus. But if we don't see a lesion, we're going to look very carefully, of course, for a lesion. If we don't see a lesion, then the most common cause of the obstructed uterus is actually benign cervical stenosis. Women who've had prior children, which is many, many women in our population, if they've had previous instrumentation or trauma, uh, they're at risk for cervical stenosis. And down on our list, but not to forget about, our cervical and endometrial cancer, such as what we're seeing in this patient. So when you see fluid in the uterus, you want to look for a tumor. But sometimes the tumor will actually be grossly invasive instead of obstructive. And in that case, you might just see uterine enlargement. This is a 91-year-old woman, and you can't even see where the endometrium begins or ends. In this case, 65-year-old woman who hadn't had a pap smear in a long time, there's a big cervical mass. Very, very rare for us with ultrasound to make the diagnosis of cervical cancer because usually patients have a pelvic exam first and uh, the physician would end up seeing that or testing for it. So we think about endometrial cancer when you have poor definition of the endometrium and loss of the endometrial myometrial interface in a patient with bleeding, usually not as advanced as this, and I'll show you some other images in a minute. Cervical cancer we're going to think about when there's a solid cervical mass that's hypoechoic. 
So let's now turn to the endometrium itself. And I have some pictures here of basically a cylinder. And I'm thinking of the endometrium as a cylinder, and we know it's not a cylinder, but I want to just show you what happens if you cut the cylinder obliquely. You're going to make the endometrium look larger. If you get perpendicular to the cylinder, then you're going to get a good measurement. How does that apply to the endometrium? Well, think about the endometrium as our cylinder. We want to line it up and cut perpendicular to it when we're assessing the endometrial thickness. So you need the uterus in a sagittal plane. By definition, we're using both layers of the endometrium. We want to exclude any endometrial fluid and exclude this hypoechoic outer layer of myometrium. Always use transvaginal sonography if you want to evaluate the endometrium well. With women with bleeding, this is a reason to do a vaginal scan. Now, patients, of course, can always decline a vaginal scan. If you have a virginal patient, you wouldn't want to do a vaginal scan. Um, even if she's very postmenopausal and is reluctant, you can show her the probe. You can tell her you'll lose lots of extra gel. You can put it in very gently, slowly, and see if she can tolerate it. Because we want to get a good look at the endometrium. Here's a very full bladder. We're looking at the uterus here in the endometrium. It looks normal. Same patient, transvag, tiny amount of endometrial fluid, tiny polyp. Why do we worry about the postmenopausal endometrium? Well, in women with postmenopausal bleeding, we want to look for the cause, polyps, hyperplasia, cancer. We also want to screen high-risk women. It turns out that women who are taking unopposed estrogen are also at risk uh, for bleeding abnormalities. Um, tamoxifen causes an estrogenic effect in the uterus. It increases the risk of cancer and also increases the risk of polyps and hyperplasia. Sometimes we'll look at the postmenopausal endometrium to titrate the progesterone dose for women on progesterone. And hormone use is something to consider when you're looking at the endometrium. Women are given estrogens to help alleviate menopausal symptoms and to prevent fractures. Uh, but estrogen use is not necessarily a benign drug. Uh, in 2002, an article came out in JAMA that really changed the way people thought about postmenopausal hormone use. And what they found in this article, risks and benefits of estrogen plus progestin in healthy postmenopausal women, uh, was that there were seven more cardiac deaths, eight more strokes, eight more pulmonary emboli, and eight more invasive breast cancers per 10,000 person years in women who were taking this particular drug regimen. And the benefits were fewer colorectal cancers and fewer hip fractures. But in this case, in this assessment, there were more risks than benefits, and therefore a lot of women opted to no longer take these hormones. However, hormone use didn't disappear, so we can't think just because this paper came out in 2002, people stopped using hormones. They decreased use of hormones. And here is a study from 2004 looking at five health maintenance organizations assessing pharmacy records and um, showing that the use of hormones had gone down but hadn't completely disappeared. So you still need to know about hormones, and you need to realize that if a woman is taking sequential hormones, meaning she's taking estrogen uh, for the first two-thirds or three-quarters of the month and then progesterone, um, that she'll actually go through um, so changes in the endometrium, proliferative and secretory phases. Uh, we looked at some women over time in that same study I mentioned before where asymptomatic women came in, um, and we looked at them frequently during the month. Eight women went in through eight, eight to 20 exams. Over time, two of them had no change, but six had changing endometrial thickness uh, with the maximal thickness mid-cycle, just like you would expect to see in premenopausal women. And interestingly, two of these women with changing endometrium were greater than 70 years of age. So here's showing um, two graphs of endometrial thickness of two women over time. Here's showing how this really looks proliferative um, and then looks the, like the normal atrophic endometrium. This is the same uh, patient from this study. So when we looked at different women who were evaluated over time, controls were on no hormones. There were few patients on estrogen only. Some were on continuous combined estrogen and progesterone, where you would expect, after a woman's been on this particular regimen for three months, the endometrium to be atrophic, um, and then sequential estrogens and progesterones. Uh, the thickness changed over time. It was greatest in this last group, 8.3 millimeters. 
but it changed in every group over time and the change some of that could be due to technical factors but some of it's also due to endogenous hormones um, the range of thickness of the endometrium was also greatest in the women who are on hormones so here the uh, graphical display of what I just mentioned that hormone group 4 the sequential estrogen and progesterone had the highest incidence of the thickest endometrium um, but also had uh, the most patients who had a changing endometrium Let's discuss tamoxifen br briefly. Tamoxifen is used to treat breast cancer and also to prevent breast cancer in women who are very high risk. It's a mild estrogen agonist in the uterus and it can cause a thick appearing endometrium with cysts. Now some of this can be the inner layer of myometrium and people call this reactivation of foci of adenomyosis. Um, so you need to be sure whether you're dealing with the endometrium or with the inner layer of myometrium, but you can't forget that the rate of endometrial lesions increases in women on estrogen. And this increase is related to the cumulative dose, how much they're taking and for how long. In this study, they looked at endometrial cancer in polyps in women who've been treated with tamoxifen. So they evaluated 15 patients with endometrial cancer who'd been taking tamoxifen, and five had cancer only in the endometrial polyp. So usually we think if you see a polyp, it's a benign lesion, it's a lesion that can cause bleeding and it should be removed. Obviously that's true, but it's especially true in women in tamoxifen because the risk of cancer occurring in a polyp is so high. So what do we do when a woman's on tamoxifen? Well, we'll talk about cutoffs of endometrial thickness, but uh, less than five millimeters, four millimeters or less, you don't need to do anything else. If there's a focal mass, you're going to recommend a hysteroscopic biopsy so that they actually go in and see the lesion and can remove it. And for all others, you probably should do a sonohistogram to see if there's a focal mass that would lead to hysteroscopic biopsy or if there's diffuse thickening where a blind biopsy would suffice. And if you do something like this, you can reduce invasive sampling procedures by 55%. All right, so how should we think about hormones overall? Well, if a woman postmenopausal is not taking any hormones, we expect her endometrium to be thin and atrophic. And less than 5 millimeters, 4 millimeters or less is normal. Why then on this slide do I have less than 8 millimeters? Well, endometrial polyps are very, very common. And they typically um, aren't problematic. They can harbor cancer, but cancer tends to bleed. So if a woman is not bleeding, if she's asymptomatic, she's not taking any hormones, we use eight millimeters as the thickness cutoff. Now, if a woman's on unopposed estrogen, she's at risk for polyps, hyperplasia, and cancer. This is somebody that we're going to worry about and watch very, very carefully. Her endometrium might be thick and might be heterogeneous, but I'm not gonna change my threshold for suggesting a biopsy. If the endometrium is greater than eight millimeters, she should be biopsied. If she's bleeding, she should be biopsied. If a woman is on daily estrogen and progesterone, again, we expect her endometrium to be thin and atrophic. It should really be just a two or three millimeter endometrium. But again, we use this eight millimeter threshold because if she's asymptomatic, if she's not bleeding, we don't want too many biopsies. We're willing to miss small asymptomatic polyps. Sequential estrogen and progesterone is the one you really need to pay attention to because here the thickness can vary with the phase of the cycle. So if someone comes in and they have a thick endometrium, even 16 millimeters, and she's on sequential estrogen and progesterone, and she's mid-cycle. This is someone you might want to bring back to see if the endometrium becomes thin earlier or later in the menstrual cycle, and if you can avoid having a biopsy. Tamoxifen, as I mentioned, the endometrium can be thick. It can have cystic spaces. You need to realize that some of these are actually in the myometrium. But just because some of the changes are in the myometrium doesn't mean you can say she's on tamoxifen, you can ignore it. In fact, you need to say she's on tamoxifen, I need to worry more and look more carefully. So let's look at fluid, endometrial fluid. Uh, normally, you might see just a trace of endometrial fluid in a postmenopausal uterus, and that's probably because there's a small element of cervical stenosis. The surrounding endometrium should be thin. If a patient has recently had a DNC or instrumentation, you might see a little bit of fluid in the endometrial cavity. If there's an infection, you might see fluid. And of course, with gross cervical stenosis, you might see quite a bit of fluid. But again, the endometrium should be thin surrounding it. Um, cervical stenosis, as I mentioned before, has an increased incidence in uh, women who've had children. 
uh, instrumentation and prior x-ray therapy. Cervical cancer, you should see an irregular mass in the cervix. This is a woman who was one of our asymptomatic women and had a whole bunch of fluid in her endometrium. And we were really surprised that she was asymptomatic. And sure enough, a couple weeks later, she started having pain due to distension of her uterus. And she'd been on sequential hormones but had never had uh, one of those menstrual cycles that you get with sequential hormones. And so she'd been accumulating all of this debris within her uterus. And once they... Uh, dilated her cervix, the fluid came out and her pain decreased. But if we see a lot of fluid, we want to be very, very careful that we look for, actually any fluid, we want to be very careful and look for any kind of mass within the endometrium. So you're going to look for focal mass, you're going to look for diffuse thickening, um, you're going to look for cystic spaces to suggest hyperplasia. A polyp, you may or may not see a stalk, it might be broad-based. Endometrial cancer, it won't just be the thickening of the endometrium, but also loss of the endometrial myometrial interface in a woman with abnormal bleeding. This is a nice study on 1,000 women who are asymptomatic, postmenopausal, and they found endometrial fluid in 12% of these women. Very, very common. They attempted a biopsy in 131, and cervical stenosis precluded sampling in 12, so you can assume that cervical stenosis was the cause of the fluid. Um, and an additional 32 had some degree of cervical stenosis. So again, maybe a third of these patients have cervical stenosis contributing to their fluid. Um, in the patients that they were able to biopsy, they found two polyps, one cystic hyperplasia, one adenomatous hyperplasia, and one carcinoma. So again, they ended up sampling a little bit more than 100 patients. They found one carcinoma. So when you see endometrial fluid, you want to look very, very carefully uh, for any underlying lesion, but the overwhelming likelihood is uh, that you won't see anything and that it will be due to cervical stenosis. I love the title of this uh, talk, uh, paper written by Steve Goldstein, Postmenopausal Endometrial Fluid Collections Look at the Donut Rather Than the Hole. So in this case, we've got a donut, a thin surrounding endometrium, fluid in the endometrium. Notice these arcuate vessel calcifications. You can ignore this if the rest of the endometrium looks good. But in this case, this endometrium doesn't look so bad. But in this case, this endometrium doesn't look bad, but we can actually see a lesion off to the side here that's invading the myometrium, and this is a very early cancer. This is what you want to look for. When we think about women with endometrial bleeding, postmenopausal women, and they have biopsies, about three-quarters come back atrophy and about a quarter come back with a lesion, hyperplasia, polyps, or cancer. And ultrasound can be very, very helpful in triaging these patients because obviously you don't need to biopsy everyone with atrophy. And a lot of studies have looked at this. And this number four, some people use less than five, less than or equal to four, comes up a lot because it turns out that if you use four millimeters as your threshold, the likelihood of missing cancer is very, very, very low. So this study, over a thousand women, atrophy, four millimeter mean thickness, cancer, 21 millimeter mean thickness, no malignant endometrium was less than five. This study, 361 women, 163 were less than four millimeters. There was one cancer. There was recurrent bleeding in 6% and they had increased endometrial thickness on follow-up in 8%. So again, we can't get rid of that diagnosis of cancer in women who are bleeding. And the reason is cancer needs to start somewhere. It starts out as a microscopic lesion and then it grows. We're not a microscopic technique, but usually by the time the cancer is big enough to cause bleeding and to cause symptoms, the endometrium will be greater than four millimeters. So postmenopausal thick endometrium. Hormone use will depend on the hormone regimen. Don't forget about that sequential estrogen and progesterone. But this endometrial myometrial interface is really important because if it's intact, there's not an invasive cancer. Now, I didn't spend a long time on fibroids. I assume uh, the people listening to this lecture know what fibroids look like, shadowing. Um, they can be sessile or pedunculated, isoechoic, hypoechoic, very rarely echogenic. If they're intramural, they're going to have that classic appearance. If they're submucosal, they can disrupt this endometrial myometrial interface. And when you look at this chart, it's only a fibroid or a cancer that can do that. So if you can't define where the endometrium begins and ends 
Figure out if it's a fibroid or not. If it's not a fibroid, you have to worry about a cancer. Hyperplasia can cause diffuse or irregularly thickened endometrium, but it can also be focal. Polyps can have a variety of different appearances. They can have smooth margins. They tend to be echogenic. You might see the vessels going in and branching, but they might be sessile and very broad-based and look like focal hyperplasia or cancer. But again, the endometrial myometrial interface should be intact. With cancer, you'll get an irregularly thickened endometrium that looks heterogeneous, but early cases can be tough to see once it becomes invasive, it should disrupt that endometrial myometrial interface. So this is looking at the sonographic appearance. Let's now look at some images. Classic fibroid in the endometrium, it's got shadowing, and this can make the endometrium very thick because it's draped around this fibroid. But the fibroid can be a cause of bleeding in postmenopausal women. Here are polyps, echogenic lesion within the endometrium, here we're seeing a single vessel inside this echogenic mass. And here this polyp is so big, it's distending the entire uterus, lots of big cystic spaces. But this was all a polyp. Hyperplasia, we tend to see in peri- and postmenopausal women. The endometrium diffusely thickened here, some cysts. It can be focal. This is focal hyperplasia here. Look at this thin endometrium here. Uh, if you see a lesion like this, of course you're going to recommend a biopsy. And cancer, I have no idea where this endometrium begins and ends. I'm going to be very worried about this appearance in a postmenopausal woman. Here, this endometrium looks very thin, very thin. Here's the fluid, and then here is this invasive mass. This is not a fibroid. This is a cancer. How does sonohistrography play into all of this? Well, the reason why we might want to do a sonohistogram, I mentioned with tamoxifen, to help us figure out if a blind biopsy can be done or if you need to do a biopsy under direct visualization. Uh, but it can also help to figure out if a lesion's real. In this case, we're looking at a very well-circumscribed fibroid uh, that's almost completely intracavitary, and this can actually define how this lesion is going to be taken out because if there was a large intramural component, it might be that it wouldn't be easily... Uh, removed during hysteroscopy, but since this is almost completely intracavitary, hysteroscopy is going to be a great way to remove it. So we use a speculum, we place the catheter into the cervix or lower uterus, the transducer is inserted, and then we have some fluid, and you can see a nice outline of this polyp. Now you might say you don't need to do a sonohistogram, you know there's a polyp there, and I have to tell you, I agree. So here's a study looking at postmenopausal women with bleeding. And they had a thickness greater than four millimeters after a biopsy. So these women had a sonohistogram after their biopsy. And what they ended up finding was that 45, 45 patients, 56% of the population, had an endoluminal mass. Many of these uh, were pedunculated, some were sessile. And the pedunculated lesions, you can kind of expect if somebody goes in and does a blind biopsy, the pedunculated lesion might move out of the way. But sessile lesions, you would think they would be able to um, get if they're large enough. The large majority of the lesions um, were fibroids followed by polyps. Um, but they also found focal hyperplasia and cancer. And of course, those are the lesions um, that we don't want to miss. Well, is it safe? What do we worry about if someone has endometrial cancer and you put fluid under pressure into the endometrial cavity? We worry that some of those cancer cells are going to go out the fallopian tubes and into the peritoneal cavity. In this particular rather old study, they looked at 89 patients with endometrial cancer who had hysterography, so an x-ray exam, uh, putting contrast into their uterus. And they looked at patients who had stage 1 and 2 cancer, meaning that they weren't treated with radiation therapy. You would think patients with spill, meaning the contrast went into the uterus and out the fallopian tubes, potentially carrying malignant cells into the peritoneum, would have a worse outcome than patients with no spill. But it turns out uh, they had one death in five years in 28 patients, whereas in this group with no spill, six deaths in five years in 46 patients. So they had a higher incidence of deaths in the patients with no spill. Now, you could do a power analysis and say this isn't statistically significantly different. The bottom line here, though, is that from the small amount of data that we have, um, we don't see an increased risk. 
What I would say is if you know it's endometrial cancer, don't do the study. Um, but if you have done a study and you suspect endometrial cancer, uh, don't worry too much about it. So summary slide of postmenopausal endometrial assessment. We look at the thickness. All right. Now I'm starting out saying we look at the thickness because I assume if there's a solid mass, you've already described it. This is assuming a homogeneous endometrium. If there's a focal lesion, it needs a biopsy. And if it's focal, hysteroscopic guidance is the right way to do that. If the endometrium is less than four millimeters and the patient's not bleeding, this is a normal finding. If the patient is bleeding from all the studies that we've talked about, the patient probably does not need a biopsy because atrophy is probably the etiology. If she continues to bleed, the gynecologist is probably going to still do a biopsy. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum, greater than eight millimeters, thick, all right? Do you need to go straight to a biopsy? Well, sonar hysterography might be helpful if you think it would change what the patient's going to do, uh, but most of these patients greater than eight millimeters are gonna to go to a biopsy unless the woman's on sequential hormones. If she's on sequential hormones, you have to figure out where she is and rescan her if needed earlier or late in the menstrual cycle, and if it's still thick, then a biopsy. Endometrial thickness in between, five to eight millimeters. This is when it matters if she's bleeding or not. If she's not bleeding, we're willing to miss the small focal polyps. We're willing to miss them. They're not causing problems. She doesn't need a biopsy. Uh, but if she is bleeding, we're gonna lower our bar five to eight millimeters, recommend a biopsy because we don't want to miss cancer. So that's it for the postmenopausal ovaries and uterus and endometrium. Thank you very much for your attention.